Welcome to SFU on occasion of tonight's talk by Lucy Lepard. An internationally recognized writer, curator, and activist, Lucy Lepard has been highly influential to many of us and has an important history uh, in, with Vancouver. We're very pleased to welcome her back to the city. My name is Melanie O'Brien, and I'm the director of SFU Galleries. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that we're the visitors here on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations, and it's this very acknowledgement that helps frame tonight's talk. Lucy Lepard's work, and particularly her recent book, Undermining, A Wild Ride Through Land Use, Politics, and Art in the Changing West, informs the work we're doing at SFU Galleries that looks at land use to consider how aesthetic investigations and how land's commodification by deposit, extraction, and development affects cultural and natural values. Thanks to Lucy for being here, and thanks also to SFU's Van City Office for Community Engagement, SFU's Institute for the Humanities, and SFU's School for the Contemporary Arts for their co-presentation of this event. I'm pleased to introduce Amy Kazimierczak, SFU Gallery's O'Dayne Gallery Curator, who will offer a more in-depth introduction to Lucy Lepard. Oh, thank you for coming. This is a tall order. I've rewritten this over many times. <laughs> so most of the people in this room would say that they live and work in this territory, in this center. But what does it mean to live and work somewhere? Much of the energy, resources, labor, and manufacturing that often invisibly supports the intellectual and artistic endeavors that we are privileged to cultivate originate in one or multiple territories and centers regionally and globally. In turn, artistic and intellectual production bears under-acknowledged pressures on peoples, cultures, and lands, both in this region and beyond. Lucy Lepard makes visible these entangled conditions in her 2014 book, Undermining, a wild ride through land use, politics, and art in the changing West. She takes up the trilateral narrative structure of her, book, her 1998 book, Lure of the Local, Senses of Place in a Multi-Centered Society, in the constellative format of six years, the dematerialization of the art object, to draw attention to the often unobserved conditions and processes of life and art in New Mexico, where she has lived for 24 years. Framed as part of the colonial construction of the West, New Mexico is linked to the Northwest Coast and the changing conditions and processes of land use, politics, and art here. The book reads as a parallel text to the pressures of resource extraction, real estate development, land expropriation, and cultural tourism that we also face. SFU Galleries has invited Lucy to speak tonight to offer her perspective on these enduring and shifting conditions. When she curated 955,000 in Vancouver in 1970, she presented a series of conceptual artworks around the city that addressed the geographic materiality, cultural infrastructure, and socioeconomics of place. 47 years later, the selection of artists, locations for work, and formal strategies to address how we relate to this place would undoubtedly look different. But that's not Lucy's work now. It's ours. We hope to take up the embodied methodologies that Lucy's cultivated through her career to, play, to pay co closer attention to how artistic production is multi-centered so that we can respond with more care to the centers we live and work in and the broader territories that our lives and work rely on. And with that, I will introduce Lucy Lepard. It was a lovely introduction. It's usually sort of a list of stuff. <laughs> now we see if I can, it, I just push the, this, this. Yep, okay. It's nice to be back in Vancouver. It's, uh, it's been a long time, but it's a wonderful place. I had a gorgeous walk for an hour this morning along the seawalk and then another half hour along the seawalk. And nobody here cares about rain. We don't have rain in New Mexico, so it didn't occur to me bring anything to do with that. So 15 years ago, 
<clears throat> I was asked to speak at a symposium in London on the global city, which didn't interest me much because I live in a tiny rural village in northern New Mexico. So I thought I'd undermine that invitation and talk about gravel pits, a verbal visual riff on cities and their origins, pits and erections, extraction in, age of, in aid of erection. The antithesis of a city, the classic erection, is its birthplace, the pit. And you're welcome to read some feminist innuendos in here. <laughs> this is by Peter Gowen. It's a gravel pit in Nevada. Soon after that talk, September 11th happened. A startling reversal, towers to pits. That and the ongoing destruction of the landscape and cultural resources in the West provided the brackets for the undermining project. Oops punched the wrong thing. It's a small book published in 2014 on which this talk is based. And the subtitle has been told to you twice now, so I won't go over it again. I always get the title of the book first before writing. So it's undermining literally, as in pits and shafts. And more specifically, the gravel pit is a stand-in for the bottom level of the 21st century landscape, what cultural geographer J.B. Jackson called the subterranean economy what we know best today is the extraction industry. And finally, undermining as a political act, as in subversion and subtext. Undermining is what we're doing to our continent and to the planet. I'm concerned with mining as land use and as metaphor, but the book is also about nuclear testing, archaeology, adobe building, alternative energy, photography, tourism, land art, Native American sacred sites, activism, climate change, and the kitchen sink literally, since water plays a huge part in the whole thing. Don't worry, I can't cover all these subjects tonight. We'd be here till the morning. My methodology is simple and experiential. One thing leads to another. And I reminded myself when writing this talk that this was for an art audience, more or less, I assume. This is by Maridel Rubenstein. It's from her volcano, volcano cycle. <clears throat> I've always been obsessed by the collage aesthetic the way Dada and surrealism explored the unknown by juxtaposing two unlike images to form a new reality. And of course, collage is also a staple of feminist art, and collaboration is its social form. So this book was an experiment, sort of an extended essay with parallel verbal and visual narratives modeled on the artist's books that I've worked with for years. And we went to the, briefly to the Vancouver Art Fair, book, book fair this afternoon. This collage is fittingly built on gravel and cement, aggregates often formed by water. What I call real gravel, naturally created pebbles, is geological debris, constructive disintegration, alluvial, waterborne, from old streams and lake beds. Unreal gravel is fake, just crushed rock, produced by dynamite and hard rock mining, socially and ecologically destructive processes. I told this to a friend who's a gravel guy, and he was horrified that there was such a thing as real gravel. <laughs> Scarce water can be used to separate it from its mother load. Groundwater is polluted in the process, and erosion flourishes. That's the fake stuff. This is by, did I say, this is by Wanda Hammerbeck. Uh, the text is part of living beyond our limits. Beyond limits is part of the piece. It's not a caption. The American West, of course, has a drinking problem. And we're not alone. The whole world is getting one. Water is a huge subject that leaks into almost every crack of undermining. They're predicting that by 2030, only 60% of the world's water needs will be met. This may sound alien in the Pacific Northwest. There seems to be a lot of water out here. But California's massive ongoing drought and fire season should bring it home to some extent. A recent outrage, and they're ubiquitous, is the court's approval of Nestle's pumping millions of gallons of water from the San Bernardino National Forest with a permit that expired 28 years ago. This is uh, by Ed Ranney, who's a, a photographer I've worked with on the history of my local place. It's a Pueblo ruin in the Galisteo Basin where I live. My last two books were also about dirt and digging, about archaeology and history of the Pueblo Indians of the Southwest, who incidentally farmed with gravel mulch to preserve heat and water. Personally, my gravel pit obsession offers me a dialectical take on the relationship between my 35 years in the New York City avant-garde and 23, now four, years in rural New Mexico. 
This is the village I live in. The interface is crucial. It's another collage. I've been riding the roads between local and global, rural and metropolitan, and wondering what art I can bring with me and what'll fit in my baggage. This is a, a gravel pit in Lucine, Utah, that belonged to Nancy Holt, the great earth artist. Gravel pits transform the geological past into dubious futures and are crucial to the production of modern spaces in the landscapes of Western states. The emptiness of the pit suggests a similar alienation of land and culture when nature is perceived as resource only. Out on the margins where local scars cover for global perpetrators, we live in a kind of mirror where negative space here is more important than what's constructed from its deported materials there. I became obsessed with gravel when the local earth mover, who happens also to be an artist, reproved me for griping about gravel mines as blights on the local landscape. He said more or less, hell, you've used gravel for your road, everybody wants gravel, but they don't want gravel mines. If you're gonna go after gravel, go for the multinationals and not the locals. Apparently Lafarge, a global gravel mining corporation, was taking over the American West, putting the locals out of business. Aggregates, it seems, is the largest mining industry in the US. This was kind of a surprise. I naively had considered gravel pits when I considered them at all as the epitome of local enterprise. You have some otherwise unproductive land and a pickup and you need money and so you go for it. Maybe it used to be like that, but global takeovers are something else. Scale is a big issue here, visually and economically. This is the Danatzin wilderness um, in Navajo land, the Bistai wilderness in New Mexico. Gravel pits aren't always eyesores. In arid western lands, the great panoramas are already gravel pits. Nature made some and humans made others, and some of those humans are artists. Earth artists were inspired by and envied the scale of the vast pits made in the earth by Anaconda, Kennecott, and other global giants, as well as the great monumental civilizations of the past, Oops, yeah. whose borrow pits have long since become part of the topography. Michael Heiser has created his own pits, like double negative here, and erections, like city complex, which is one mile long and 500 feet high in the long-suffering state of Nevada, where his archaeologist, archaeologist father analyzed native petroglyphs in the Great Basin. This will virtually replace a nearby mountain being removed by Anaconda, which donated the earth piecemeal to the artist for his monument. It will be visible primarily from 25,000 feet above but it's also recently been included in a national monument and it'll be protected for the ages. This is another mountaintop renewal uh, project that I couldn't resist showing, it's such a beautiful image. It's by Michael Light, it's an aerial view of literally a mountaintop re removal in uh, Las Vegas, near Las Vegas for a housing development, for an upscale housing development. This is Nancy Holt's Sun Tunnels in Utah. Uh, a picture taken by NASA, I found this on the internet. I have a lot of pictures of, of sun tunnels. I've been there often, but I love the idea it was taken by NASA. In the 1960s and early 70s, I was very enthused, as were so many of us, about earthworks, now known as land art. They were among the many escape attempts of the time, ways to get out of, beyond the city and the art world's institutionalized trajectory. I always loved being outdoors, and here was art coming out to meet me. Since the mid-1900s, 1990s, however, I've written about land art in the rearview mirror because it's been replaced in my windshield by land use or cultural geography. Living in the West, land has become more than a site for art, more than a landscape to admire. It's a place, a collaboration between people and nature. This is by Will Wilson. It's uh, autoimmune response, a Navajo man, the post-apocalyptic Diné or Navajo man's taking in the sort of toxic landscape. Living in the West, land has become more than a site for art, more than a landscape to admire. It's a place. Did I say this already? Anyway, I still respect a lot of the earlier work, but the better I know the New West, the more my attention is claimed by peripheral vision, by the sideshows, the side of the road shows, life on the land. I've learned a new vocabulary or perhaps overwritten the old one.
This is Charles Ross's star axis, also in New Mexico. It's an instrument for seeing time. You can climb these stairs through 26,000 years of a cycle of, of uh, precession. So classic American earthwork, for the most part, was above or beyond it all, a mostly urban art borrowing the emotional power of extraordinary Western landscapes. Land was kind of a raw material for individual expression, and space was a kind of mat within the frame around the photograph. A pseudo-rural art made from a metropolitan headquarters. Earthworks take much of their power from distance, distance from people, from issues, and even from places. There were even religious overtone, undertones along the lines of the 19th century sublime. Isolated from everyday experience, often in the desert, an iconic spiritual site, most land art is site-specific but not place-specific, superimposed on a place and its inhabitants rather than collaborating with them. And here's sun tunnels again with our dog, our, pet, our late dog, Rez. <laughs> The best of the classic land artists offer simultaneously a spectacle and an intimate experience, instruments for seeing rather than objects to be seen. This is a cemetery in Chilili, New Mexico. I like to think the word gravel is related to the word grave. Living in what was becoming New York's Soho in the 1960s, I watched the Twin Towers go up and in 2001 over the radio in New Mexico, I heard them come down. This is Joel Marowitz's famous image of this. On their way to becoming the most famous pit in the world. So soon it was just a hole in the national psyche that replaced earlier ground zeros, the Trinity site in New Mexico and the craters of the Nevada test site. Fresh Kills Landfill on Staten Island, slated to be an art installation in part due to the tireless work of Merle Yarman, Latterman Eucles, who did this piece, became a cemetery without markers and other flattened erections. Erection, because this was where some of the remains from the Trade Center went. This is a piece of hers called Penetration and Transparency Morphed, which is finally getting going in fresh kills. This is by the Anything Company, who I trust you all know about, Ingrid and Ian Baxter's wonderful company, <laughs> corporation. Uh, Vancouver-based for many years. Pits and ruins epitomized the anti-object stance of some 1960s conceptual artists who decided the world had had enough objects, though it didn't keep them from making more. They focused on the appeal of absence rather than presence, the invisible rather than the visible, the horizontal rather than the vertical, ideas rather than commodities, the dematerialized rather than the monumental object, and so forth. Smithson liked to quote Carl Andre saying, a thing is a whole in the thing it is not. And in his 1967 tour of the monuments of Passaic, New Jersey, he talked about how full of holes, the prosaic Passaic, seemed in contrast to solid New York. This is the 1977 Smithson glue pour for the show that was mentioned that we did here. Uh, and it's a Christy Kiakos photo. It's impossible to talk about gravel in an art context without confronting the monumental presence absence of Robert Smithson, who brought to North American attention the notion of the Earth's raw materials as art and the entropic appeal of pits. His first proposed earthwork in 1966 was called Tar Pool and Gravel Pit. And just before his accidental death in 1973, he was trying to get Peabody Cole to find fund and reclamation artwork. Years ago, I was driving through the Navajo Nation and we invited ourselves onto Peabody Cole's domain on Black Mesa, a fenced off reservation within the reservation. Oops. Okay. I wanted to photograph the humongous pits and machinery that echo other industrial sites dotting the Navajo Nation. Peabody supplies energy primarily, supplied energy primarily to Las Vegas, a Nevada desert gambling town that now has a population of one and a half million and counting. I was about to take the picture when I was stopped by a drive-by Peabody security officer who was Navajo and she said, no photographs. No photographs is a common and historically justified admonition on Indian lands. 
especially at sacred sites and during the seasonal ceremonial dances. In some of the New Mexico Pueblos, you can pay to take pictures, but for the most part, they're discouraged. So I'm down with the idea that unpermitted photographs can be unacceptable cultural invasions. But Peabody Coal, maybe it's sacred to capitalism. This is a photograph on Canyon, I mean, an image from Canyon de Chez where they made this very clear, also on the Navajo Reservation. At the time, the whole beautiful Black Mesa and a lot of the area's very scarce water was disappearing into the pockets of the corporation. Black Mesa itself is a major archaeological site and the location of myriad Navajo and Hopi sacred places. Maybe the Navajo security officer had a double agenda. In Wyoming, there's an industry protective state law forbidding photographs of blights or crimes even on land, even public land, even if the photographer is not trespassing for fear that the images are going to be used for anti-industrial or environmental causes. This is another photograph by Ed Rani. I've become increasingly interested in what I call critical landscape photography, another whole lecture, because it works in the gap between art and life where I really like to hang out. Despite its mountains, the horizontal is iconic in the landscape of the American West, not just the plains, but the sprawl, the journeys, highway and railway that lead to the growing cities, the road that becomes a place in itself, a place of mobi a site of mobility, as J.B. Jackson put it. We're drawn through the landscape on what Cellist Glendinning called the fingers of imperialism. These gridded lines inform a way of seeing that flattens and blurs the places they run through, like photography which I think is one reason photography has grabbed so many contemporary artists as it's grabbed me too. Landscape photography is often preferred by the apolitical connoisseur since it appears to have no content. Some of the most gorgeous images have been used as propaganda to grease the wheels of manifest destiny or profit-based tourism. But it's also used by environmentalists to save what remains of wilderness, and it can be a unique way of communicating places to those who will never see them firsthand. This is just outside Moab, Utah. This is by Lewis Helbig. It's residual bitumen, an aerial view of the Alberta tar sands. At the same time, many environmentally concerned photographers have struggled with the beauty of ugliness. Wounds on the land, vast strip mines, mountaintop removal, colorful toxic waters can be striking and even beautiful. Many believe that beauty can powerfully convey difficult ideas by engaging people when they might otherwise look away. Others accuse photographers <clears throat> like Richard Misrak of aestheticizing disaster. This is by him. Those who choose beauty for this subject matter are most effective when they're also aware of the flip side, when their choice of beauty is a conscious means to counter brutality. This is by Michael Light again. It's an interchange in Mesa, Arizona. He obviously has a very good camera. <laughs> These images are always like sharper than everybody else's. Tourism is the straw grasped by desperate economies, by poor states like New Mexico, and by places abandoned by lumber, mining, and gas oil development. Land art is not exempt from the touristic impulse. Adventurers from back east and abroad forge their way over bumpy dirt roads to see the great monumental earthworks, which have become the trophies on the art tourism checklist. Visitor centers are planned for Charles Ross's Star Axis and James Terrell's Roden Crater. And uh, oh, yeah. well, this and Walter de Maria's Lightning Field already has its own exclusive infrastructure. This is Roden Crater from a distance because it was, it's hard to get a photograph of Roden Crater allowed out. Uh, this is the land art of the American West program looking at Roden Crater from a great distance. Land art can simultaneously participate in regional economic development and slyly call attention to the fact that many famous Western landscapes are surviving precisely because of cultural heritage and recreational tourism. This is Roden Crater from the air. However, I've come to the reluctant conclusion that land art is mostly for people from the cities. Land art, or the land itself, offers an antidote to an urban landscape often crammed with art and visual competition. 
This is uh, by Patrick Nagatani. Uh, there's uranium tailings left by Anaconda on the uh, Laguna Pueblo in New Mexico. Indians and archaeological sites, the military and the nuclear industries, are tourist destinations in New Mexico. Tourism and history, of course, are sort of joined at the hip. A few decades ago, several of these elements came together in the uranium mines in the pueblos of Alcama and Laguna and in the Navajo Nation, eventually killing off a lot of those picturesque native people. Not to mention the fate of wildlife. Grizzlies are long gone in the southwest. Black bears starving in droughts come down out of the mountains for food and are killed or displaced. In New Mexico and elsewhere, cougars, coyotes, and wolves are fair game. As, in tradi as traditional rural industries like ranching and mining subside, bowing to the contradictory needs and greeds of contemporary society, abandoned pits and toxic sites like the Rocky Mountain Arsenal, which you see here in a photograph by Dory Klein, outside of Denver, become wildlife and bird sanctuaries faster than anybody thought it was possible. And this is partly because so much habitat is being destroyed by urban sprawl and gas and oil extraction that the critters really have to settle for whatever they can get. This is by Terry Evans. It's the back on oil fields. In 2008, when we fought fracking in the Galisteo Basin where I live, I didn't realize it would be a continental battle. I didn't really know much about fracking. It just didn't look good. When tar sands <coughs> excavation began to devastate Alberta and the back and boom transformed North Dakota, I didn't realize that the deadly tar sands were also headed by rail into Maine, which is another one of my home states, as an export site, or that our entire nation would be drawn into the battle against fracking, and your nation too, obviously, now proved to be disastrous for water, air quality, and even causing earthquakes, another subject that's too vast to take on tonight, but well known to the Canadians to you all. This is by Edgar Heap of Birds, who I'm sure you've seen. <clears throat> Here's a lot of pieces around the UBC campus and so forth. In the American West, it's been said, nature is politics and politics is nature. In the Canadian West as well, we see collisions of two incompatible land uses, indigenous sacred sites and resource extraction. Given the fact that native peoples inhabited the entire continent for millennia and that oral traditions produce very long memories, it's not surprising that ancient and contemporary sacred sites are ubiquitous in virtually every state in the Union. Nor is it, this is by Tom Gray Eyes, who's uh, Navajo. Nor is it surprising that ignorant white people dismiss indigenous claims to apparently undistinguished natural features, migration paths, almost invisible shrines, and places where med medicinal plants are gathered or where legendary events took place. This is by Hilea Tanagini. Navajo and uh, other things. <laughs> Native uh, sacred sites are significantly often embedded in or embodied by nature herself. The fundamental issue here is that we colonials are hard put to understand the sanctity of unimproved pieces of earth. The intricate connections between mountains, springs, and lakes in Native American sacred uh, religious culture are evident all over the world. First Nations, and this is Navajo uh, protesting. This one actually worked. The Desert Rock was another huge power plant that was going to be started in Arizona, and it, it actually didn't get underway, believe it or not. But First Nations have been protesting tar sands exploitation, as you know, since 1966, and it's been proved to be poisoning the air in their communities. Idle No More pioneered the protests against Dirty Crude, and other groups have sprung up, many of which are led by elder women. Naomi Klein tells us that the tar sands near Fort McMurray, Alberta, has a climate plan that would allow emissions to increase by 43%, wholly incompatible with the Paris climate agreements. And she blames this on the founding narrative of Canada as a, quote, bottomless resources trove. This image is by uh, Jetsonorama, which is his street name. He's, he's actually an African-American physician who works on the Navajo Reservation, has been there for 25 years, named Chip Thomas. <clears throat> he does these wheat-pasted things on, on very rural faces of, of uh, buildings or the remains of buildings. This one is called Burning Fossil Fuels is a Dark Cloud Over Future Generations. 
Oh, I'm sorry, this was uh, Fort McMurray. So Standing Rock on the Sioux Nation in North Dakota is only the latest example of First Nations fighting back, but its scale is unique, a gathering of more than 200 U.S. recognized nations protesting the Dakota Access Pipeline under the Missouri River, protecting not just sacred sites, but above all, water. They call themselves not protesters, but protectors. Hopefully the outcome will be as successful as the Lummi Nation's recent victory over big coal in Washington State in the coal export terminal case, in which the US for once honored its treaty of obligations. And hopefully Canada will step up to the plate and understand or confirm the connections between cultural and environmental justice. Although Canadian mining companies, as you probably know, are accused of abuse and discrimination of native, native women, and your new Trudeau has already approved one pipeline. He could also approve the Kinder Morden Tar Sands Pipeline, and he has okayed the LNG thing <laughs> for, for natural, pipeline for natural gas in British Columbia, which will have an enormous climate impact. So he's not as good as we'd hoped, apparently. This is also by Thomas Gray Eyes, who's Diné Navajo. It's called Angel, Water in the Desert. It's no, this is by Rose Simpson. It's called Ground. It's a recent exhibition at the Pomona College Museum. It's no accident that many young native artists like Rose Simpson from Santa Clara Pueblo get into post-apocalyptic imagery. For centuries, native peoples have lived with and resisted the possibility of their world's ending. In this context, Meryl Monkmasters, she's playing, whoops, that's still Rose, there's Meryl who is Plains Cree. Her work gives tree-hugging a whole new meaning. And the title of this painting by Lawrence Paul Yuk-Wellipton that was at the MOA till today or yesterday or something speaks for itself. The title is Red Man Watching White Man Trying to Fix Hole in the Sky. These artists are not alone, and this too deserves a whole other lecture, which I'm thinking about doing. Climate change is giving landscape photography a new mission. It can show us where we are, point out devastation we may have ignored, leading to remediation. Some photographers like Shabankar Banerjee, who did this in his Arctic work, declare themselves activists first and artists second. They aren't challenging the medium of photography so much as they're dealing with political land use issues. An individual style is not his concern and can be really difficult to tell some of these works apart, which is not an insult. Uh, this is called Known and Unknown Tracks, Oil and the Geese. And the Geese. It's about the tundra in the Arctic that supposedly was untouchable, but George Bush allowed uh, oil exploration to come in there, and you see the lines of the tracks of people coming in for oil exploration. This emphasis on Content, content over individual style is central to the work of the Center for Land Use Interpretation based in Southern California. A significant in innovator in landscape photography, it's a unique blend of art and geography, disingenuously apolitical, dedicated to, quote, the increase in diffusion of information about how the world's lands are appropriated, utilized, and perceived. It has a land use database, a peripatetic land use museum, a site extrapolation division that conducts real and virtual tours of unusual and exemplary land use sites, as well as a residency in Wendover, Utah, and elsewhere around the country. It's quite a, gotten to be quite a, a corporate thing in itself. Artists' names are usually not attached to the factual photographs. This is one of their pictures of a coal train in Wyoming. I spent a couple months in Laramie last year, and I watched these coal trains go in and out every hour. The sly blandness with which Cluey presents its images belies the hard information they offer about militarism and corporate destruction and deleted communities, as they put it, and gravel pits. Their work, as a friend puts it, trumps cynicism. In 2003, Cluey mounted Margins in Our Midst, an exhibition about gravel, the material that makes up the ground we live on, they said. They conducted a tour of the pits in the Los Angeles suburb of Ir Irwindale, the largest aggregate mining area in the state, if not the nation. 
It's so full of holes, they say, that more of the land of the, in the city is a pit than not, and boasts some of the most banal and dramatic landscapes in Los Angeles. By the time we're done, says Cluey, we probably wouldn't be able to tell the difference. This is another Cluey image from Irwindale. So artists often get involved in these issues even when they don't quite see themselves as activists. British artist Chris Drury's sculpture pointedly titled Carbon Sink, What Goes Around Comes Around, was constructed of beetle-killed trees, of course climate change produced, and installed on the campus of the University of Wyoming in, in 2011. At the center of the vortex is a pile of coal. To make a long story short, the sculpture was deinstalled long before its scheduled demise because conservative Wyoming has a very short fuse when it comes to coal. The director of the Wyoming Mining Association took the arts message personally, unfurling veiled threats for funding to the arts. All this recalls a recent New Mexico kerfuffle when the newly elected Republican land commissioner got rid of Brickface Hope by sculptor James Tyler, which was installed outside his building by the City Public Art Program, and he replaced it with a pump jack, more symbolic than he may have realized. So much for hope. I have to admit that my favorite art in the land is not contemporary. Across the Americas, aboriginal earthworks, geom geomorphs, and rock art, petroglyphs and pictographs, are found by roadsides on golf courses and in the remote deserts, forests, and canyons. Where contemporary land art demands all the attention like a spoiled child, rock art quietly absorbs us into its place, even when we understand very little about the messages we're getting. Although individual images stand out, they're most compelling in relation to each other and to the place and clues they offer about the cultures that created them. Many of these sites are still utilized ceremonially. And of course, it's easier to identify with the people who were once stewards of that particular landscape than with today's property owners, who are likely to appear with a rifle and arrest you for trespassing. <coughs> My dog is illiterate. So, hmm, I thought I had another image there. There it is, yeah. So this, as you probably know, is Jeff Wall. It's called Fieldwork, and it was in, uh, Fieldwork period hope. The University of California was doing archaeological work on the uh, land of the Stolo Band, and Jeff, as he does, recreated the, the whole thing from a scaffolding and so forth, sort of reenacting history in real time. So hidden in evidence of the distant past often surfaces in gravel pits. Blackwater Draw in eastern New Mexico was the site of a major archaeological discovery in the 1920s when a Native American named James Ridgely Whiteman, who remains uncredited with this breakthrough, found the first Clovis point in association with mammoth bones, which brought the human record on the continent back to something like 13,000 years at that point. He realized the significance of his find and alerted the Smithsonian, which blew him off. Eventually, archaeologists got the picture because in the early 30s, the state of New Mexico began to dig gravel there and unearthed masses of huge bones. This time, the archaeologists swarmed to the site. Blackwater Draw, once a watering hole for mammoths and their ilk, and also the site of the oldest well ever found in the New World, became history. Later, it was history in another sense. The post-war highway boom demanded gravel, and the site became one of the largest gravel mines in the state. The past was once again sacrificed to the present, which, and the spectacular evidence was reburied. What could be salvaged, which was not much, is now on the National Register of Historic Places, and a small museum is open to the public. But it's been banned by local fundamentalists because the earth couldn't possibly be that old. So how's that for a sequence of events that incorporates ironic, multicultural, multinational, local, global paradigms? <laughs> This is by Chris Dikiakos, who has photographed in uh, Vancouver for many years. And this was part of his uh, exploration of what was happening to the city during the Olympic series at the time. Eudora Weldy once wrote that one place understood helps us understand all places better. So for years I've been preaching the importance of the local. 
taking responsibility for the places where we find ourselves and understanding its social ecology. The connections between everything existing there, including human inhabitants. inhabitants. I'm constantly reminded how global my local reality really is. Nearby are the highway down which trucks carry transuranic waste from Los Alamos and elsewhere to the waste intensive pilot plant in Carlsbad, a pit that receives rather than gives, a geological lockbox for chemical sludge, lab gear, and filters laced with radioactive plutonium, the detritus of nuclear weapons production. Waste drums of this stuff, and maybe worse, is buried almost half a mile underground in salt beds, supposedly secure for 19,000 years. But surprise, in 2015 there was one of those accidents, and the place has been closed down for the time being, despite constant attempts to just start it back up no matter what. In fact, they just said today, I think, that they're closing down part of it. They're going to have to close down part of it. Then we have Los Alamos and the Trinity site at White Sands Missile Range, where the first atom bomb was detonated. There's no escaping these things wherever you are. In New York, I once lived a few blocks from Canal and Broadway, a site once chosen by experts as the most efficient target in the metropolitan area for a nuclear strike. Klaus Oldenburg once proposed a monument for the spot. Nothing is more local than ecology, and nothing is more global than a militarized world fueled by greed and disregard for the land itself. Our most recent debacle in our area was Gold King. The horrendous leak from an abandoned Colorado mine caused ironically by workers for the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. It's now one of the hundreds of Superfund sites that's been disastrous for farmers downstream, especially the Navajo in New Mexico. And it kind of looks like art, the, the Orange River, maybe Cristo, which makes it really hard to compete for real art, to compete with for real art. This is by Drew Lenahan, who made this installation from combined photographic context with artifacts dipped in that orange water from the animus. This is by Beverly Natus uh, from Vashon Island in, in Washington State called Reframing Eden. So if the heyday of and the funding for huge artworks is largely in the past, restoration projects still make a lot of sense. Here's a real and valuable function and work for artists who think big. It's by Patricia Johansson who's been doing this for many years. It's called Ellis Creek Recycling Facility in Petaluma, California. She magnifies images of natural plants and creatures. There's a, a marsh mouse in here and so forth. All over the West are unsightly gravel pits and slag heaps and mine shafts and overgrazed pastures and trampled riparian areas and piles of hazardous waste leaking into our drinking water systems, all begging for imaginative remediation. Artists, architects, and landscape architects working together have come up with some innovative notions about what to do about the world's accumulating brownfields. Yet another lecture. The difference between the earthworks of 40 years ago and more recent restorative eco-art is not only the ecological consciousness gained in the intervening decades, it's also a broader sense of the world beyond the site. Artists are good at provoking questions, slipping between the institutional walls to expose the layers of emotional and aesthetic resonance in our relationships to place, to the history of production buried in the land. This is uh, the Future Farmers Victory Garden in front of the, one of the state house, I think, in San Francisco. Not the state house, some big thing in San Francisco. This is uh, Amy Scaife at the Tate Museum in London. This was a protest against BP's funding of the Tate, and the Tate Modern, and the Tate, the regular Tate, too. Amy Scaife is given credit for this. I don't know whether she's the photographer or the person curled up here. So sometimes artists are also brave enough to fight institutional power, as these people are. Eco-art often invades natural and infrastructural systems to maintain or rehabilitate them without resorting to the quaint and the retrograde Contemporary artists and collectives all over the world are demonstrating that they can think micro as well as macro, local as well as global. A more modest kind of land art, urban and rural, has its roots in conceptualism. 
uh, like this piece of Mary Misses, which was a prediction of floods in Boulder, Colorado in 2007, and they actually came true. This was a piece that marked where floods could come because of climate change for a show I did there on climate change. This is, again, another lecture in itself. This is by Aviva Romani, part of her Oil and Water and Money series. As I work on local water and land issues, my mantra has become long-term thinking is in short supply. There's a point where artists, like everybody else, have to take some responsibility for the places they love, a point at which colonization of magnificent scenery gives way to a more painfully focused vision of a fragile landscape and its bewildered inhabitants. But dire warnings for the distant future don't go over well in the US, and probably not Canada either, even since 911. We Americans are often immune to long-term thinking, reluctant to give up our vaunted quality of life even as we watch it crumble before our eyes, as money goes to war and tax cuts for the rich instead of to social services and confronting the enormous cloud of climate change. This is a piece that artists did outside the Louvre in Paris. It's not fear-mongering to say, get off the track, a train is coming. The US, with 5% of the world's population, uses 20% of the resources. Our way of life is endangering everybody, and our government seems powerless to stand up to the powers that are taking us down. The rush to access all the remaining two-thirds of the Earth's fossil fuels before the tipping point in 2050, and, and which I think has been moved up quite a bit, and before we come to our senses is pretty terrifying. This is a, a lousy slide of Chris Jordan's, uh, one of his Running the Numbers series. This is 320,000 light bulbs, which is the number of kilowatt hours wasted in the US every minute due to energy inefficiency. So saying no to big oil and big coal and big everything else is apparently beyond us. The real problem to oversimplify is capitalism, based on endless growth now impossible to sustain. As Slavoj Zizek, Zizek, I'm pronouncing him right, uh, has wryly commented, it's easier to conceive of the end of the world than the end of capitalism. And we have to wonder with Charles Bowden, why can't we imagine a future where we have less but are more? This is by Oliver Ressler. As I said at the very end of Undermining, the book documents only fragments of a moment in time. Almost every case study I used there and here in this talk could be replaced by dozens of others as the narrative races on. Every issue raised here is in flux. Every outcome is a cliffhanger. If there's a point to it all, it's to urge you to stay abreast of these issues and to make art about them. Art can't change the world alone, especially at this moment when it seems that nothing can. But artists can be worthy allies to those challenging power with unconventional solutions. Nature writer Rick Bass once mentioned that the activist is the artist's ashes, emerging from the pure into the impure. I prefer to think of artists as phoenixes arising not from the ashes of their own aspirations, but from the ashes of obsolete definitions of art. That's what inspired these ramblings. So thank you, and I'd love to have discussion after this. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to say that there are, are mics wandering around. Um, so if you want to ask a question, I guess you have to have a mic. How do, how do you say you say? If people could just wait. There's two people walking around with microphones. If you've been here before, you're familiar with it. Just please do wait until one comes to you so everybody can hear the question. And I'm lousy at repeating the question. So. So. It doesn't have to be a question. Discussion is fine as long as it doesn't go on forever. <laughs> and I will patiently wait until you get it together. You agreed with absolutely everything there, right? <laughs> well, there must be a brave soul here somewhere. Uh. My question or comment has really nothing to do with art, and I apologize for that in advance. However, um, I spent a fair bit of time in the California desert. I don't know, I've never been to New Mexico. I spent some time in the Arizona desert, but I know the California desert quite well. 
Over the last 20 some odd years, I've watched the relentless march of uh, solar energy plants, which is something you, you didn't mention. And I'm struck by the dichotomy between solar energy, which is allegedly a green technology, and what it does to the landscape. A lot of Canadians are not familiar with what's going on down there, where you have plants like the Ivanpah, Ivanpah plant, which covers thousands of acres, south, south of Las Vegas, which has three reflecting towers 500 feet high, which incinerates something like 3,000 birds a year who happen to fly into their range. Right, that's in the book. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's also the, I know the area down around Desert Center very well, which is halfway between Palm Springs and Blythe. There's, they, I, for many years, there was an attempt made, attempts made, and successful finally, to stop a giant landfill, which is going to go in an Eagle Mountain. Uh, the, a pair of jojoba farmers opposed it for years and finally won. No, no sooner did they do that than the Desert Sunlight Plant was put in there for 6,000 acres, covering with solar panels, which is essentially wilderness habitat occupied by the desert tortoise and a lot of other animals that now have their habitat destroyed. And I'm wondering how we tolerate this benefit, which is pretty much keeping the lights of Phoenix, Las Vegas, LA burning, and we're sacrificing wilderness to do that. Because every time I, I've, I've commented on this on various media sites, and every time there's inevitably somebody who pops up and says, well, I suppose you'd prefer coal fire generating plants. No, I wouldn't. But where is the balance? Where is it soft? How do we reconcile these two, this, this dichotomy? Because I don't, I don't know how to respond to you know, well, this. Well, guess what? Neither do I. I mean, it's, uh, no, you're absolutely right. And, and I do, Ivanhoe is, is uh, Ivan Pa is in the, in the book. And it, it's, it's one of these horrible choices that we seem to be forced to make because of the horrible choices we've made previously. I, I don't know. I mean, I've read about the tortoises, the birds, and so forth. It's it's horrendous, and yet, and the same with the wind turbines, which is the other alternative. Uh, the numbers I, I've heard some of the numbers contradicted and changed, and so forth about how many birds, how many tortoises, and so forth. But it's still it's a vast industrial thing, and it would be lovely if if uh, the the utility companies would allow people to have rooftop solar, for instance, instead of that kind of thing. There's the real problem of the transmission lines. We don't have the, the technology for that. We should have, but we don't, because the utilities don't make money off it. I mean, we're fighting this in New Mexico with a vengeance. Our utility company want, is, is pushing nuclear and coal as, as renewable energy instead of doing what they should be doing or should have been doing for years. So I wish I had an answer, but I don't. We, we, we fought this for many years in BC with hydroelectric power, which there's currently a dam being constructed in northern BC, the third stage of the Peace River damming, and that's going to cover tens of thousands of acres of arable land, uh, land that is na native land. Uh, it's, it's, it's going to be underwater permanently. So where would you put it? What would you do? I mean, you don't have any... I, I, don't I, either, but I don't. I don't. I don't have the answer. I honestly yeah. don't. And I'm. So, I wish, I'm looking for somebody who does because I would love to come up with one. <laughs> but I'd be an art writer. <laughs> I, I, in, in terms. In terms. In terms of solar energy, I think, like you say, a solar energy. A, a solar energy cells on every rooftop in L.A. I'd love to see that. Mm -hmm. but I, I've been on. I've on off the grid for 25 years, and I plugged the whole thing into my car originally which is, again, one of these weird choices because I had to drive the thing every day to keep the battery going so I, my one light in the house would keep going. <laughs> so it, it's, it's, it's an incredible conundrum. I mean, thank you for bringing it up, but I wish I had an answer. Somebody else? Actually, hi, I'm going to jump off of that a little bit, and I just wanted to say that, just apropos of that really quickly, that it's been shown statistically that the power from that will be generated by the Site C dam is not needed in the foreseeable future, except perhaps by the fracking industry up there yeah, to there, um, keep the LNG plants going and to fire to to uh, send off energy to Alberta, tar sands as well. Um, I'm heading off to an arts and energy summit in England <laughs> next month, at the beginning of next month, and this this business of um, how to get a smaller footprint while giving ourselves the energy that we want it has been a big topic. And I don't know if you know the work of um, the Land Art Generator Initiative? What? The Land Art Generator Initiative? No, I don't think I do. Okay, that's Elizabeth Minoian and Robert Ferry. And they, you might 
recognize it because they had a big um, competition at Fe for Fresh Kills Park. Yeah, I've, I've heard of it, but I yeah. don't really know. Okay, so what this is is this is large scale public art that is also energy infrastructure, but it's also designs uh, intended to be community specific. So, I think the question is how do you not how do you get the power? It's <laughs> it's how do you get the power? Um, it's got to do with industry. It's got to do with the energy industry rather than the technologies that really do exist that could enable us to yeah. have infrastructure in our own homes and buildings. No, absolutely. And, and we, we were close. We have a wonderful group called, uh, called uh, well, we have a wonderful group called Positive Energy, but uh, the, another group, New Energy Economy, which has been fighting our utility in, in New Mexico. And, but we have this thing called the PRC, which is the Public Regulation Commission, which is corrupt. I mean, you know, it's, it's, and it voted three to two or two to one or something. Very, very close. It's a very small thing against the thing that we were all for <laughs> because, of, and for the utility. So, it's, I mean, it's, it's kind of an offshoot of Citizens United. I mean, as long as you have money running everything, there's, it's, we are relatively powerless no matter how powerful we are or could be or try to be or whatever. It's, it's, we're at a very strange moment. <laughs> I'm not going to live to see how it, how it comes out, but it's pretty interesting. And all of you younger people had better get out there and work your asses off. Yeah, yeah some, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I can't hear until this thing gets to you. Since you've been back here, what is the biggest change that you have noticed since you were here? Well, I've only been here for a day. <laughs> so, yes, uh, but even when I go and come back for three months, I notice these huge changes. Yeah, but I wasn't. I haven't been here for like fifteen years, so I'm not really going to be too good at that question. I mean, it. I mean, it's. I, they're always tall, funny-looking buildings. But I don't remember, but they may have. Some of them may have been here when I was here last. And the tankers in the bay, and but that I mean I, I really have <laughs> been here one one twenty four hour time so it, it's I just don't know enough what would what are the changes that you've seen could you talk into the thing no. she's coming testing oh, oh. no okay. I notice how we our land has been used, and we do ignore the First Nations stuff that's happening on the North Shore. We also ignore some of the stuff that they're doing, that we're all doing, that we're buying into the whole environment of, we have to build these condos, sell places for millions of dollars, and have no thought about what's gonna happen in 10 years, what's even gonna happen tomorrow. So that's my worry. Mm. Um, I mean, I think that's a worry for everyone, and I think we need to start, start really standing up to the corporations and think about what we can as people do. Well, what do you think we should do? What's the number one thing you think we should <laughs> I do? Just, I, didn't I know, know it's, a, it's a weird question. the world's problems tonight. But, uh, uh, I mean, I am an art writer. <laughs> I can repeat. <laughs> But, uh, and, and an activist, and you know, we get out and do our thing and sign petitions and send money and march in the street. And, but I really think that art can, making art can be a, a, a powerful thing. I mean, it can really make people think about things. And there's not enough art about these issues. And there's certainly not enough public art about these issues. So I just, that's, I mean, that's not what I do, I write about what artists do, and I keep hanging around waiting for artists to do something I can talk about. <laughs> um, Lucy, you said something that I really liked hearing, and I'm wondering if you could speak to it a little bit more. You, oh look, at my phone just shut down, so I'm not going to copy you properly. You said you like hanging out in the. Uh, the gap between where art and life are, and that's where you like to hang out. Can you speak to that a little bit more? Yeah, I've heard, years ago I, I wrote something, I can't remember when, but talking about how I was looking for social energies not yet recognized as art. 
And since nobody ever quotes me as saying that, I'm always quoting myself saying that. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it is something that interests me a lot because, I mean, I think artists can make, I mean, the whole Rauschenbergian thing about anything an artist does is art. I think that's, that's not exploited enough in a funny way. Uh, every day we see things, do things, and so forth that we could frame. And it's artists who do the framing. I mean, as a, as a writer, I, I could, I suppose I could go ahead and write essays about framing in my daily life, and maybe I should be doing that, but, but I wait for artists to be doing that. But uh, I mean, I, I also, for 20 years, I've published the monthly community newsletter in my little village of 250 people. Uh, and a lot, of the, a lot of what we talk about is environmental issues. And I think I, you know, I can frame them for the people who live there. Guess what's coming down the pike now? One more development, one more fracking, one more oil well, whatever. And, but I think that's, that's something we could all think about better. And, and I think art teaches us how, Ad Reinhardt said, art teaches us how to see. And, and the framing, I think photography has been important to me that way because I find myself, I'm not a particularly great, I took that by accident. <laughs> um, but it, it, it's a way of, I'm always looking at things and thinking, oh, you know, that'd make a nice image. But then the question comes up like, okay, what are you going to do with that image? Is it just a pretty photo? I mean, more and more pretty pictures and so forth. So, uh, but that, I think, you know, if I were an artist, I would have more of an idea of what to do with those those images or those things that pass through my mind or whatever. And I wish there were more of that, and I wish art schools were pushing that more. Maybe they are. I mean, I don't go to art schools. So. Um. Here I am. Hi. Um, thank you very much for your uh, wonderful talk. Mm -hmm. I'm here. Um, I have many questions, but I'm, I'm going to limit myself to one. Uh, I'd be interested, so you presented a lot of very interesting um, work, uh, enterprise, uh, art projects. Uh, um, uh, yes, and I assume that many of them required uh, uh, facts or scientific evidence, and uh, perhaps some artists even worked with scientists. And I'd like you maybe to talk a little bit about that uh, new relationships and new solidarities uh, with, with science. Uh, yeah. yeah, I did a show in Boulder, Colorado, where a lot of big national science buildings and organizations are. And a, a, f a friend who's been involved with this much longer than I have, Marta Kern, sort of made me do this show. She, it came up and she made me do it. But anyway, it, one of the things that we were concentrating on was artists working with scientists. And the piece I showed by Mary Miss, The Blue Dots, that was a very simple piece. It was. It was like tops of paint cans, painted blue and mounted in various places that were in danger of flooding. And, and a couple of years after that, Boulder had a huge, several years after that, Boulder had a huge flood. And by God, these places were flooded. And so that was her a science input. I mean, she'd worked with a hydrologist to figure this out. And she didn't just put this thing up and thought, oh, this looks like it might flood. It was all figured out. And a lot of people did things like that. And uh, Aviva Romani, who I didn't show the, her, she's done a, a piece called The Blued Trees, where there's a pipeline coming through, I think it's New York State, where they painted the trees blue along the level of the pipeline, pipeline and have created music that goes with these things. Don't ask me to explain this exactly. But uh, anyway, it, it was based on a case where an artist did some uh, environmental action and called it art, and, and it was preserved because it was art. And so she's doing a similar thing on a much larger scale. She's got a lot of people out there doing these blue trees, and, and it's, it's gotten a lot of attention and, and so forth. But there, it's a, they, then there again, she was working with scientists to figure out how this would work. When um, some of the, one of the scientists who worked with Newton and Helen Harrison, who were one of the earliest ecological artists and most impressive ones. Uh, they worked with a scientist talking about climate change and how animals and plants were having to go up mountains. And then at the top, there was no place else to go. And that's happening all over the place. The pika is one of the little animals that's having to go up and is going to have to jump when they get up or whatever. And the scientist they worked with told them, said, well, I can't come out and say this. 
but I'm I'm pretty positive this is this is the way it is. But I haven't got the endless research and peer support and blah 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 to say precisely this. But you can make art about it and say it. And I thought that was really impressive. I should have shown their their piece, but uh, it's a video showing this mountain. The mountain is a greenhouse or something like that. But there, I think there are a lot of ways that, and scientists, the, the ones we worked with in Boulder, really liked the idea of working with artists, partly because of this. They could get their message out without putting their careers in jeopardy, I guess. So there are a lot of ways that that can happen. There's a book, a, a magazine now called Science Art or something that I haven't really seen, but I keep getting advertisements for, so you might look at that if you're interested in that. Look, Google it. <laughs> Thank you very much for your talk. I, I was really um, pleased to see your interrelations uh, that you made between militarism, tourism, and capitalism, and land use. And um, you, you quickly ended your talk, and I, I wanted to ask you, and I know you did a lot of framing around historical work, uh, land art, um, and you showed various, you know, different kinds of work uh, to not illustrate in a negative way, but to, to drive home your point. But I'm, I'm curious about what you think uh, when you said artists, artists rising from obsolete definitions of art. So what do you consider from your vantage point, having been a very important art writer, um, and thinking about the kind of most current issues of the day, right from you know your earliest work to right now, what do you think are obsolete definitions of art that no longer hold in this particular moment in history? Yeah, well, it's, I mean, it's object art, and I don't have anything against art as objects. I think we should always have museums, we should always have people painting in studios and so forth. It's an important part of our culture and society, but <laughs> I, I do think that uh, there are far broader definitions. The social energy is unrecognized as art is one, one of the ways I would put it, that you can look at your world and make it art. I mean, why not? It's art is just whatever we see and so forth. So I just would like to see the, the definition of art expanded hugely. And also, I don't think art has a context in this society. There, it's sort of pushed aside into these galleries and museums and so forth, and sometimes public art, if, it, if people like it enough to let it stay there uh, and don't vandalize it or whatever. But. Uh, I think that you know that there just has to be a, a really far more a broader definition of art, and that has to start with art schools and with students. So, are you um, thinking about social practices as a? As yeah, social practice. I hate the term; it sounds kind of clinical. Okay. But, uh, well, but, well, we could it, call but it. I, but I definitely you know, am all for it. I mean, so, okay, is that what you're alluding to, though, in terms of social that's energies? That's certainly part of it, and it's so interesting that the art world has. Uh, embraced it to, to a large extent. I mean, somebody like Suzanne Lacey, who's been doing this for 30 years or 40 years, um, is is now sort of recognized, to, although they still really don't know what to do with it. I mean, there, there are museum shows. Future Farmers, which I showed here, is in museum shows and so forth, and Mary Miss, to some extent. She's doing an, an incredible, huge project in New York for now the last couple, least couple of years called Call, uh, The City is Living Laboratory. And she does walks, there's a, a line down Broadway from way, way to hell up uh, in the Bronx or wherever, and then down to the tip of Manhattan. And she has these walks through neighborhoods where people talk about the ecology of the neighborhood and, and uh, people follow a little tour sort of, and science scientists are involved and artists. And, and this is a, a huge vision of hers as this is a good example of this uh, broadening the, the notion of art, because Mary was a, an object maker and, a, and an eco art maker and a public art maker, but she's really gone beyond that, way beyond that now, and, and in her late 60s, 70s, I guess she's 70 something, and that's really interesting to me. And Aviva Romani is also in her 70s, I'm, I'm being an ageist here, um, <laughs> but who was very involved in the feminist movement for many, many years and so on, and has thrown everything she has into ecological issues now. It's, Sounds it's like interesting. a lot of women are doing this. Uh, there are a lot of more 
I don't want to sound, again, sexist, but uh, there are a lot more women working with this kind of thing because I think women do work better with communities and with understanding where they are than a lot of male artists who tend to be pretty focused on their own thing. Great, thank you. So shoot me. <laughs> are we running down or is this someone? Hi, thank you very much. Um, you're really inspiring. I have um, an environmental degree and an art degree, mm. and I've worked in the environmental, I did work in the environmental field for quite a while, and I'm realizing that a lot of what I was doing then could have been called art, um, like watershed walks and that kind of thing. Um, I, I, you know, when I, when, I brought, when I brought those themes into art school, I did installations on ocean acidification, um, it was, it, maybe it was because I'm just a student and the quality was lacking, but it was accused of being flat. <laughs> do, do you know what I'm talking, like, so I just wanted you to talk about that. I mean, that's sort of, yeah, the, 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 the confluence of politics and art, um, and, and I, and I'm, so I feel like I've sort of fallen for this. I mean, this is a... Um, uh, this criticism. So I just wanted you to talk about that. Hmm. Well, you oh. have to watch out for those criticisms in art school, because I, 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 as a feminist, I went around to art schools for ten years or so, looking at women's studios and hearing women's stories and so on. And it, it was it really opened my eyes as to how women were being treated. I trust it's better these days, but uh, we certainly worked hard enough to get it better. But. But it, it's, I don't know, the ocean acidification, I, one of the pieces it was by Judith Hursko, look up her work in this show I did in Boulder in 2007. It was called Weather Report. But anyway, she did some beautiful pieces about ocean acidification. I don't know how people, they, and they were beautiful. They probably weren't flat. I mean, whatever, whoever <laughs> told you that, I mean, whatever that meant. Uh, it may have meant that it wasn't, you know, expressionist. I mean, who knows? What, where this person was coming from who told you that, because that's something we have to look at very carefully. It's like, okay, who is saying this stuff? But uh, that same thing is said about activist art all the time. It's didactic, it's uh, obvious, it's this and that. And mostly it just means that people aren't used to seeing that in an art context, and they don't know how to deal with it, so they call it not art. And calling it not art in a funny way is sort of a compliment. <laughs> but I don't, I don't know what you were doing and how flat it was or wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the things people could actually go inside and there was, you know, actually people really, students really liked the piece, so. I guess you well, have there to you go. Listen to it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just wanted to say quickly that um, for every stream, virtually every stream in BC, there is a stream keepers group. So for people who are wanting to work with um, people on the ground um, concerned about the environment, um, there are people out there um, doing that. Yeah. yeah, and that's something, I mean, again, artists really do need to get their hands dirty in terms of ecological stuff. They need to go out and see what's not just, it's not about a pretty picture, it's about what's actually happening on the ground. And <clears throat> I'm involved in watershed restoration because I live right on a, a creek. It's called the Rio Galisteo, but most people would not call it a river, it's trickle, it's about that deep. And, but it's, it's water and it's important. Anybody else, can we? Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, I just had a question just to follow up on, it's so much about, so many of the environmental problems are about energy. We keep talking about energy and clearly, um, Right, energy has consumption has to go down, and lifestyles have to change. And I was just wondering if you had a comment or any thoughts on um, so much of in the past that same energy was labor, human labor, um, and any thoughts or ideas about going forward or new forms of energy or switching back to human labor, that type of thing. I don't know. I, I, this is certainly not my, my field, but uh, I, I've heard that, I mean, there are a lot of claims made that renewable energy will 
we'll, we'll have as much as many jobs as the current energy system does and so forth. And I was horrified when the Standing Rock thing came up with the, the AFL-CIO came out against the Native Nations and for the pipeline because it was supposed to have more jobs. But I mean, this is not constructive. But yeah, uh, human labor is going to be doing something different. I mean, it's, it's really rough on the people who, who do coal. But if their states were replacing those, those coal mines with renewable energy instead of just digging their heels in and screaming and yelling, then people would have jobs. I, oh, can, I'm, I meant more like household labor, like even washing your own clothes, that type of thing. I, I was know, thinking I more like. A washing machine <laughs> or a dishwasher, so I still do the human labor thing. So. Uh, hmm. I mean, that was supposed to be the, the whole idea about what 50 years ago or 30 or 40 years ago was that, you know, we were going to have all this leisure time because of technology, because the, the machines were going to do the work. Well, that has certainly not happened, and everybody is just, you know, glued to their little screens all the time, and frantic to get the next place or whatever. It's it's crazy. I mean, I've, I've lived for almost 80 years, and it has certainly changed, and nothing, human labor has not been benefiting from this endless technology. But I'm a Luddite, so I, I take that with a grain of salt. So, as you can do. So that's enough. Thank you very much. A good question. <laughs>